Seeing as he is ready for a conversation, Duke Gilton asked Philin if the cancellation of his engagement with Lady Thibessa was true, as expected he denied it. The follow-up question was obviously raised with malice. When Duke Gilton asked if the rumors about Lady Thibessa being the Emperor's mistress were true, shock filled Philan's face, making it evident that he wasn't expecting such rumors to be circulating about his fianc. The next night, there was a thunderstorm at the capital, worrying for his staff, the emperor decided to make rounds and send home those who stayed to work. As he was getting out of his office, he noticed that there's still light in the adjacent office's window, knowing that it was Leela. He hastened to scold her, only to be greeted by an empty room. Assuming that Leela just forgot to extinguish the candle, he went around her desk only find her hiding underneath it her hair loosened from its ribbon as she hugged her knees to herself. As he scooted over to ask what's wrong, a peal of thunder startled her. It wasn't the thunder that scares her so, but the tragic memories associated with it. It was a stormy night when the late Duke and Duchess died on a carriage accident. Loneliness seems to attack her more vehemently during thunderstorms. Seeing that she's already crying, as if she's out of her wits, the Emperor gently held her in his arms and told her to look at him. With hazy consciousness, she hugged him tighter and asked him to sing her a song. Ridiculous as the request was, he indulged her and sang her a lullaby. His voice was so soothing that Leela failed to fight the urge to sleep. She woke up on the couch covered by His Majesty's long coat, berating herself for her shameless act. She wondered aloud how would she face the Emperor, his nonchalant voice telling her to just look at him, as if it's the most natural thing in the world, brought her back to her senses. After invading her personal space and making sure she's truly all right, the Emperor told her to take the day off. He even went as far as providing her a new gown as change of clothes and giving her a ride on his horse. Before they arrived, Philin was already hounding Leela's residence, still believing that he has the right to meddle with her life. Philin was already making plans of getting rid of the residence. As he was helping her alight, the Emperor sensed someone watching, following his instincts. He saw Duke Williot hiding by a pillar near the gates of Leela's residence, glaring at Philan's direction. He made sure that he exudes the most threatening aura without Leela's knowledge. When the Emperor has left, Philan tried to approach Leela, only to feel somebody else's blade on his throat. It was Hiltine, conveying His Majesty's message to Duke Williot that he must stop plaguing Lord Thibessa with his presence. Philan would have fought Hiltine had he not considered the public that might actually see the fight, and the fact that he was a royal knight and His Majesty's shadow. Seeing that Duke Williot has relented not to fight, Hiltine escorted him away from Lord Thibessa's residence. Unbeknownst to her, Duke Williot's sudden visit was due to Sisley's scheming, telling him to bring her back to the Duchy's mansion since she considered her as family, because she'll be the one playing the role of mother for her child. Inside her house, Leela received her maid's report that Duke Williot visited and was looking for her. An immediate dread filled her. The mere thought of returning to the suffocating home was enough to make her feel strangled. The day of the party came. Leela wore the aide's uniform provided to her. Awkwardly, she greeted the Emperor and Lord Delrent, and almost curtsied even when she was wearing pants. Before they faced the guests, the Emperor reminded her to stand her ground. She soon discovered why. As the double doors of the hall's entrance opened, she immediately saw the man she hoped she'll never see, Andante Thibessa, the second son of Count Thibessa, he who is well received by servants and fellow nobles, tried to molest her in the past. After the Emperor's toast to the fallen heroes, Leela decided to get some air, as she was discreetly crossing the vast ballroom, a hand suddenly grabbed her shoulder, ready to swat whoever dared to touch her. She saw Lord Delrand when she looked back. He apologized for startling her. He just thought she might want to spend some time at the balcony. Reaching their destination, the cool night air soothed their heated skin because of their stuffy uniform. Jokingly, they discuss how do they greet each other when wearing their aide's uniform. Left with an empty glass, Beer decided to get another glass and offered to get one for her too. When he left, Leela thought it was him who returned when the door made a sound. But no, it was Philin. 
wanting to talk to her. The mere sight of her ex fianc made her skin crawl. Deciding to leave, she walked past him, but the man had other plans. He doesn't want to let her go, insisting that she must go back with him to the duchy. Fed up with his stupidity, she decided to officially end their engagement. Dragging him by the wrist, they went to face the emperor. She requested the emperor to officially end their engagement. Believing the rumors, Philon mocked her, asking if she really believes that she'll have the interest of the emperor forever. The very man in question intervened and asked Duke Williot what if it's forever. Seeing as the young duke won't let go of Lord de Bessa, the emperor offered his hand to Leela. Pondering over things, she hesitated to take his hand at first, but after thorough consideration, she took his offered hand. She left Philon alone, sealing the end of their engagement. Leading her to the elevated part of the ballroom, the emperor announced her appointment as baron. Beer discreetly prompted her to kneel. That night, Leela Thebessa was bestowed the tile of Baron Estela. The nobles got enraged that a woman was bestowed a title, it may not be based on an existing law, but it's been custom that women are not bestowed with a title. At the Duchy of Williot, Philon was enraged with what transpired at the party. He wanted to get even with Leela and bring her back at the Duchy once and for all. Riding on horseback, he went to the capital to visit Leela's residence. He caught her just as she was leaving for her job. He tried to persuade her to come back, until it became coercion that eventually led to a brief argument. Philon stopped his almost assault to Leela when he felt that killer aura once again, asking her for the last time if she's coming with him, and being told no for the last time, gave finality to the dissolution of their marriage. Philon stupidly held on to his belief that the reason for Leela's change of heart was the emperor. And Leela, getting fed up with Philon's endless flaws, decided to move on without looking back. After the incident with Philin, Leela decided to review the archives and find a document that shows a woman has been bestowed a title previously. It was then that the emperor came and told her there wasn't. She's the first. Even when he tried to assure her not to worry, it was evident in Leela's eyes that she's being bothered. The emperor then asked her if she's seen data on the diplomatic dispute that happened because of the river between Natusa and Khan. Not only did Leela saw, she wrote her own consolidated report. The emperor was impressed by her work. He decided to use her material as document he'll present to the nobles during their talks about diplomatic relations. At the meeting, the document contained brief, but clear historical data about Khan and Natusa. Khan, an island located southeast of Hetan. Because it is a small island with only about 20 imperial citizens, it is not marked on maps and has no lord that manages it. As such, it became lawless and secretly used as a den for pirates. Natusa, on the other hand, is made up of seven islands on the eastern side of the continent. It is a small country with powerful warships and navy. Dispute is a common occurrence between the two. As of late, Natusa made an absurd demand to the empire that owns Khan. To do so is akin to defeat and will narrow the empire's territorial waters. Amidst the discussion, a nobleman raised the issue of Baron Thebessa and the fact that she's a woman, as expected. They are raising their objections based on the customs and not the written laws. To put an end with their endless whining, the emperor asked a certain Marquis Valdir about what he thinks of the materials they used for that day's meeting, assuming it was Baron Delrent. He has nothing but praise for the document. It was perfect. There was good information including the explanation of the situation and a summary of past responses. It was then that the emperor revealed that it was Baron Thibessa who wrote and prepared the meeting materials they are reading. Upon knowing that it was a woman, the nobleman started to find loopholes in the documents. Anyone who sees or hears them would feel nothing but disgrace. As if to save face, Duke Gilton raised a suggestion. If the emperor is truly confident of Baron Thibessa's ability, why not send her on a diplomatic mission? The emperor relayed it to Leela. At first, she was hesitant, but upon knowing that the emperor wants her to take it so she can prove her worth, she agreed to do it. When things were finalized and set in motion, 
The nobleman questioned the position that was bestowed to Leela. She was appointed deputy to the emperor and not assistant to the emperor. The emperor explained that he is giving her the freedom to use her abilities so she can show off what she can do for the empire despite being a woman. Duke Gilton mistook the emperor's actions as something that a young smitten lad would do, but he was completely left speechless when he was told that she was just being kept at his majesty's side because a skilled assistant is needed. Still, life continued for Leela and she made preparations in connection to her imminent departure on a diplomatic mission. One fine day, she can't be found in the palace grounds. It was her day off, but instead of resting, she used it as an opportunity to visit a company called Nabea. They are the exclusive company that trades wares from the Natusa kingdom. While Leela was inside, her maid, who was left outside to wait for her, was approached by Andante, the Thebes's second son, casually. He asked about Leela, masking his words with concern, but he was obviously gathering intel, using the lame reason that Leela's birthday is coming up and that he plans to surprise her. The maid naively let out some information, thankfully not that crucial, but enough for Andante to have a gist of the situation. Thanking the maid, he gave her a bag of coins. When the maid tried to reject the money, he tricked her into accepting it by saying that the money was for Leela's gift, loyalty won over pride, and her desire to make her mistress happy. The maid accepted the money, Andante left with a malicious snide. Leela finished her data gathering inside Nabea Company. As she went outside a blue flash from the corner of her eyes caught her attention. A tall man with hair as blue as the morning sky was being surrounded, people didn't really recognize the emperor, but because of the color of his hair they thought it was him, much to Leela's horror. Their hunch was right this time. Wanting to save him, Leela made an absurd move. To stop the man that was to assault the emperor, Leela grabbed the arm of the man with blue hair and called him honey. She scolded him for dyeing his hair blue. A momentary shock crossed the emperor's face, but he immediately understood what was Leela's intention. He snaked his arms around her waist and pulled her in a tight embrace, playing the role of a smitten husband. People believed their farce, and any suspicions that the blue-haired man was the tyrant emperor vanished. They were led to a dark alleyway, which Leela would learn soon as the black market. To protect her, the emperor pulled an extra black cloak from inside his own and covered her with it. She was given specific instructions not to remove her cover at all costs. Upon entering, they were greeted by the side of child slavery. Children were being sold as slaves. Their age barely reached the age of 10. Seeing that Leela was concerned, the emperor reminded her that the empire allows it. Hideous as it may be, they cannot do anything with their current situation. With heavy footsteps, they tread the expanse of the black market and reach the stall of an old woman who sells all sort of things. Upon gazing the man in front of her, the old woman was able to discern his true identity. Unfazed, the young emperor inquire about the poison he's been looking for. Hearing their exchange, Leela recalled that the emperor was also looking for a poisonous plant during their market research. Done with his purchase, they started to leave. But one of the men of the black market announced that the henchman of the emperor has penetrated the scene. Swords were drawn, and a manhunt for them began. Grabbing her by the shoulders, the emperor led her to a secluded door that leads to a waterway. Leela can't swim, but he assured her that it will be fine. Hugging him tight, they jumped into the canal. Leela held her breath and wondered how long must she do so. But after 10 seconds, she felt ground beneath her feet. Opening her eyes, she saw the royal palace looming over them. It seems that the emperor can do water magic. He safely sent them home. Upon knowing that he can do magic, Leela showed enthusiasm akin to a child. It was adorable that he got mesmerized by it. When she started to leave, his body just moved on its own and reached for her hand. He stopped her and asked her to stay with him for a while, mistaking it as a request to discuss work. Leela asked if there was something he needed to add to the details of her diplomatic mission. Her statement brought him back to his senses. He let her go. As he watched her leave, 
He wondered what in the world possessed him to reach out for her and asked her to stay. Reaching her residence, she was glad to see her maid came back safe and sound. It was Hiltine who escorted her back, and she seemed to be quite smitten, it was expected, knowing how good-looking the white-haired knight is. When she asked if anything happened, her maid said no deliberately keeping the fact that Andante Thibessa approached her. The day of the delegation's departure came. Leela donned the aide's uniform and went to the palace to check the last-minute preparations. Entering their office, she found it empty. Assuming that Beer has left for an errand, she looked around and found a copy of the material she wrote for the meeting, knowing that it was an international affair. She knew that it's imperative that the Minister of Foreign Affairs be informed of the latest development. Taking the document with her, she went to their office. However, the Marquis' chief aide did not let her meet with him. She was informed that he was away. Still, the document in her hands needed to reach the man. She handed it the chief aide and informed him that it's about the diplomatic talks about the kingdom of Natusa. Being discriminatory because of her gender, the chief aide ignored the document and ordered his assistant to dispose of it. Not knowing how important it is for the minister to see its contents which are imperative for the upcoming diplomatic talks. Leela was heading back to their office when she heard Beer called out to her, turning to his direction. They exchanged pleasantries and discussed itineraries for that day. Upon the mention of her visit to the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, concern filled his face, but seeing her unrelenting aura assured him that everything went well. They were having a light discussion, when all of a sudden, Beer enveloped her in an embrace and pushed her by the wall as he covers her with his body. Wasps have entered the palace hall. If at some inopportune moment, someone sees them, they would be mistaken for lovers doing something inappropriate. Unfortunately, said person who saw them was the emperor. His voice rang across the hallway as he asked what they were doing. Sadly, even his presence wasn't enough to break the embrace the two are sharing at the moment. Seems like even Beer is afraid of wasps. Asking why such pests are inside the palace, Beer hotly replied that it's the gardener that must be questioned. Agreeing to his words, the emperor used magic to get rid of the flying terror. Having done so, the emperor sent Beer to talk to the gardener, while Leela was asked to join him in his office. As they walked the halls, he asked if Leela and Beer were in a relationship. She clearly said no. In his office they discussed the details of the child care proposal. She answered all his questions and clarifications that it was almost noon when they finished. When the emperor asked about how she feels regarding her departure, she honestly told him that she's nervous. He nonchalantly laughed but was kind enough to remind her that if ever she forgets anything, or if things are getting tough, she must never forget that she represents the emperor. His words of assurance boosted her confidence. She gave him an affirmative nod. The emperor watched a diplomatic entourage leave. As he did so, not diverting his eyes from the window, he summoned Hiltine and explicitly ordered him to guard Leela secretly, should there be someone who dares to harm her. He should dispose of that person without reservation, regardless of status. Beer, witnessing how the emperor was worried for Leela, told him that if he is so worried to the point that he sent Hiltine to guard her, he shouldn't have sent her away. The emperor informed him that it was Leela's decision, to which Beer rebutted that he influenced her. The reason behind it was because he wanted to make Leela show that she is deserving to the title of baron that was bestowed to her, so that the nobles would quit their yapper and to stop the ugly gossips. Done with watching from his window, the emperor turned to face Beer and handed him the orphanage documents. He will be in charge of the project while Leela is away. Beer protested that by doing so, Leela's hard work may go unrecognized. The emperor told him that it was Leela's will, regardless if her efforts were recognized or not, she chose to expedite the child care center to lessen the hardships of the orphans. Beer gushed in awe with Leela's honesty. Before he went on his way, he informed the emperor that the person at the villa has been craving for his presence, even if Duke Gilton frequents the place, it's a totally different matter if his majesty visited. 
Furthermore, the person at the villa is deeply interested with Leela Thibessa. A gentle smile crossed the emperor's face as he declared that it isn't the right time yet. He'll introduce Leela to the person at the villa when she's ready and has been properly recognized as a baron. Understanding his liege's wishes, Beer started to leave. But before he can do so, another document plopped on his hand. It contained the proposal for the abolition of slavery. Meanwhile at the duchy, Philon has arrived and was excited, only to be greeted by grave news. Sisley gave birth to a stillborn, the gardener and other servants are making preparations for the funeral. Philon went ballistic, in a frenzy, he summoned the physician that attended to Sisley's labor. According to his findings, the premature birth happened due to poisoning. Rage clouded his judgment. He summoned all the servants and inquired if anyone saw someone suspicious or someone acting unusual. A maid, working directly for Sisley, and is in cahoots with her scheme reported that the head maid, Misha, who is known to be loyal to Leela, was seen with a suspicious bottle prior to dinner time. Furthermore, she was the last person seat to push a food cart inside Sisley's room. As if on cue, a knight came rushing to report that an empty bottle was found at the back of the duchy's mansion. A manhunt for Misha was ordered. The first object of search was her room, which unexpectedly was locked. Ordering the butler to open it, using his master key, they were shocked to see Misha's body bathing in her own blood. Somebody slayed her, and judging from the state of her blood, it seems it happened some time ago. With the culprit dead, Philon decided to visit Sisley who coincidentally, or maybe not, woke up. She was asking about her baby. When she was told what happened, she went on a frenzy. The doctor was summoned to administer calming medicine. When Sisley fell asleep, Philon left the room after gravely threatening his servants that he would not tolerate anyone if something similar happens next time. Unbeknownst to him, the doctor who reported poisoning as the main reason for the stillborn and the maid who reported Misha as the culprit were both in cahoots with Sisley. She employed them to carry out her scheme. Sisley may be laughing with glee, thinking she won, but the fraud doctor noticed that Philon wasn't showing signs of a man in love when he was dealing with her. Meanwhile, the entourage has arrived at an inn to spend the night. The innkeeper raised concern upon seeing that a lady was accompanying the lot, assuming that it would be all male, considering that it was the emperor's entourage. No room is available, except for a shabby one. Leela was ready to accept it, but Marquis Valdir intervened, outrightly treating Leela as a lady and not as a member of the delegation. He insisted that someone from their group give up his room. The unfortunate Zephyl, who was the youngest among the delegation, was the sacrificial lamb. Said Zephyl did nothing to hide his rage, the uncomfortable journey turn even more rough with the recent incident. The subtle bullying didn't stop there. The other members of the delegation team were deliberately addressing her as lady, never using the title of baron nor calling her as lord. Attempting to help with the luggage proved ineffective. They just saw it as an opportunity to brush her off and rub it on her face that she is not useful because she is a lady. Fed up, she chose to stay inside her carriage to study the documents she brought with her, but the insult was so potent that it's affecting her, she can't seem to concentrate. A sudden explosion of fireworks in the sky eased her mind's turmoil. It seems that they are near the residence of their host, and it was their way of an advanced welcome. The light from the fireworks illuminated the sea. Seeing for the first time, left her in awe, wishing that she could see it up close. Upon their arrival at the Marquisate of Hutton, Marquis Valdir immediately exchanged pleasantries with the young master of the house, Alder Hutton, son of Marquis of Hutton. Leela's beauty didn't do unnoticed, and upon inquiring who she was, Marquis Valdir introduced her. As she was representing the emperor, not as a lady but as deputy, she didn't curtsy, she offered a handshake instead, However, Alder took it as a gesture asking for a kiss on a hand. The moment he gave her a perfunctory kiss as he looked up at her, she felt shivers on her spine. 
the way he looks at he was very similar to Andante's. Preparations were made. The butler informed her that her presence is not required not until dinner time. Granted some free time, she approached Marquis Valdir for permission to go out and see the sea. His nonchalance with his permission made Leela feel something is going on where she is not privy. To make sure that she is not mistaken, she asked once again if it's truly all right. All she got was an okay. The dread she's feeling just increased. However, because it was her nature to be trusting, she went on ahead and took Marquis Valder's words at face value. Seeing the sea up close alleviated some of her worries. But as soon as she arrived, the dread that she's been feeling was validated. The hall of the Marquisate was uncannily quiet. Marquis Valdir was nowhere to be seen even if dinner is about to be served. Asking a footman on duty, she discovered that behind her back, the Marquis went on with diplomatic talks without her. Rushing to the meeting hall, she saw that the meeting has adjourned. The Marquis deliberately greeted her and inquired if she enjoyed the sea. Leela understood the situation. She was clearly excluded because the Marquis refused to recognize her as part of the delegates, even when she defended herself that the butler misinformed her. The whole lot claimed that they heard she was properly informed of the meeting. They were certainly ganging up on her, making her appear as if she's an irresponsible woman who only knows leisure. As the Marquis passed by her side, in hushed tones, he told her to stay quiet and go back to the capital. Dejected, Leela lay awake, regretting her actions, beating herself for being incompetent. She was wallowing by herself when a maid handed her a magic communication tool. The Emperor was on the other line, asking if she arrived safely. Answering his query, she asked if things are fine in the capital. The Emperor informed her that it's been raining there per usual. Hearing his voice prompted her to cry. She felt ashamed that she failed him, as if sensing her plight. The Emperor reminded her of her position, the power he bestowed upon her, and the right to act as his deputy. The call was cut short, but Leela gained enough confidence to act assertively. She is the Emperor's representative. She shouldn't hesitate and do the work that was assigned to her. Morning, the Natusa delegates came. They were composed on three men and a woman, just like Leela herself. They exchanged pleasantries, but somehow, Alder was able to ruin the mood by not following protocol. He approached them, as she and Sir Andrian were having a conversation. The way he addressed them was an insult to their status as members of the delegation team of each other's territories. Without sugarcoating her words, Baron Andrian reprimanded Alder. She even corrected Marquis Hutton when he addressed her as Lady. Leela admired Baron Andrian's assertiveness. She exudes the air of a delegate that properly carries their title as representative of their liege. Meanwhile at the Duchy's mansion, the issue about Sisley's fake miscarriage, which is a fake pregnancy to begin with, continues. A new report was made. According to a maid, she saw the bottle in Leela's possession on the day that she was leaving the Duchy. Said bottles seemed to have been found by the late head maid, Misha, when she rummaged her mistress' things in the storage room. Rage and shock filled Phylon's face.